Now that we've had a chance to talk about the structure and functionality of Java Phaser, as well as explore some of its key methods, we'll take a look at an example application that demonstrates how to apply Java Phaser in practice. This particular video is interesting because it will take some of the pithy examples you'll find in the Java doc documentation for Java Phaser and then completes them to make them something you can actually run and experiment with on your own. This particular example also showcases phasers both used as entry and exit barriers, as well as shows them in their use as both one-shot and cyclic barriers. We'll first take a look at the test driver program that runs all the various examples that illustrate phasers in all their glory. This particular program has a factor method called make tasks that returns a list of so-called my task objects. It doesn't really matter what my task does. You're welcome to take a look at the program if you'd like at the link at the bottom of the uh, earlier slide from my GitHub account. But basically, we don't really need to know the details of what it does to make sense out of the way in which the phasers are being used for different purposes. The make tasks factor method uses the int stream class in order to be able to create a range of values from one to s number of tasks, which let's assume for sake of argument is 10. Each of those numbers is then converted into a my task object by using the my task constructor reference, which takes those numbers, say one through 10, and creates my task wrappers around each of those numbers. And then finally, we use the collect terminal operation to collect that stream of initialized my task objects into a list of my task objects, which get returned as the return value of the make task factor method. There are a pair of test methods that we use to demonstrate various features of Java Phaser in both their one-shot form as well as their cyclic form. The first test is called run one-shot tasks, and that calls the make task factor method to make the list of, factor, of uh, my task objects. And then it goes ahead and shows how one-shot phasers can be used to run this list of tasks, making sure to start them all at the same time. In this particular example, it uses phasers as both entry and as exit barriers. The second example we'll look at is called run cyclic tasks. That also uses the make task factor method, except what it's going to do is it's going to run a test that showcases a cyclic phaser that repeatedly performs actions for a given number of iterations that are part of the cycles of the phase. So let's start by talking about the one-shot phaser first. This will demonstrate using a pair of one-shot phasers that will be used to start a list of tasks to run simultaneously. And we'll see it as we walk through this, it uses both entry and exit barriers. As you can see, the run one shot tasks method is passed a list of my task tasks. And the first thing it does is it goes ahead and it makes an entry phaser and it gives it an initial value of one, which is the value of the parties that will start to initialize this. And what we're basically saying here is we're initializing this entry phaser to include the calling thread is one of the parties. And you'll see how that gets used in just a moment. The next thing we do is we go ahead and we create an exit phaser. And here we're going to make a phaser that has a count of parties as large as the number of tasks that we're going to be waiting for. And this particular example, this particular phaser will be used to some extent like a countdown latch, although it's a bit more flexible. As we saw here, we're going to use this first phaser as something similar to a cyclic barrier. Again, somewhat more flexible. So let's now go into the main part of the program, this test example. So we're going to use a, a for each method on the tasks parameter. And we could also use a for each loop, but for each is just a bit more modern. So that will iterate through every task in the list of tasks. And the first thing we do for each of these tasks is we go ahead and we register with the phaser, indicating that this particular task will now be a dynamically added party. So the number of parties that are part of the phaser will go up by one. This ability to be able to dynamically add new parties is something that's not found in Java cyclic barrier. You have to know a priori at the start how many of the parties there will be. And once you've set that, you can't change it. Whereas one of the things you can do with phaser is, is make those changes dynamically, as we're showing here. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to create a new thread for each of the tasks. And we're going to create the thread and we're going to start the thread. And as we'll see in a moment, that newly created thread will be used to run the task logic. You can then down, see down here for each of the threads we create, 
we're going to use the entry phaser, which we created outside of this for each loop and outside of the thread as a part of the Lambda expression that's used to run the code inside the thread. And what we're gonna do here is we're gonna use the arrive and await advance method on the phaser, which will cause that thread to block until all the worker threads have started. So basically they're allowing all these threads to defer their actual running until they're all ready to go. So nobody gets a head start. You can think in this mod in this way that the arrive and await advance method on a phaser is actually very similar to the await method on a cyclic barrier. So in essence, what we're doing here is we're using the entry phaser as a one shot entry barrier. So nobody gets to run until all the threads are at the starting gate, chopping at the bit, ready to get started. Once everybody's ready to go, then each of the threads will be released. They'll return from arrive and await advance, and they'll each call task.run, which will do its thing. We don't really care what it does, but it, it does something interesting. And then what happens is after the task is run, then we go ahead and use the exit phaser in order to say, I've arrived. So each thread on its way out as it finishes up its processing will tell the exit phaser that it's, it's arrived. And that essentially is using the phaser and the arrive method in much the same way that you might use the countdown method in Java's countdown latch. But here we're able to use it for the phaser. Now, outside of those threads that are created and run in the context of that for each method, the original calling thread, the one that was used to invoke the run one shot tasks method, will call the arrive and deregister method on the entry phaser. And what that does is it basically says, I'm here, but I'm not going to be considered any further in the processing. So by arriving and deregistering, that essentially lets all the other threads that are waiting inside the, the uh, thread lambda expressions in the arrive and await advance method, they'll get a chance to start running when they all get to that point, and then they can do their thing. And the other thread will continue on to its next step. The next step in this particular case, just for kicks, is to call the exit phasers await advance method, passing in zero. And we start out the phases in phase zero. And so what that's basically saying is, go ahead and wait until the other threads are done calling arrive, in which case they will then advance to the next phase. And what we're doing here is we're essentially using this to block until all the worker threads have finished. So in a sense, the await advance method is being used here in a similar way to the countdown latch await method. So we're using it as an exit barrier. And after all the threads are done, then the calling thread itself can go ahead and return. And when I run the program for you in a bit, you'll see exactly how all this works. So that's the end of the overview of the one shot example, which again demonstrated using phasers in both a cyclic and a, I'm sorry, it uses, it uses phasers in both an entry barrier and an exit barrier like manner. Let's now go turn our attention to another example it's part of the same application that illustrates how to use cyclic phasers. And in this case, we're gonna call a method called run cyclic tasks, which will repeatedly perform actions for a given number of iterations. And this is more powerful and a bit more complicated. So we'll walk through it a piece at a time. As with the earlier example for the one shot entry and exit barrier uses of Java phaser, you can get this code in my GitHub repository in the EX26 folder in the link at the bottom of the slide. This particular method is passed in the list of tasks and the number of iterations to run. The first thing it does is it creates a new phaser. And you'll see that the way this phaser is created is it's created as an anonymous inner class. And what it's going to do is it's going to have an on advance method that will be used to determine when to terminate the phaser. So this is a little bit like the, the barrier action that you can have for a cyclic barrier. And it's basically a hook method as we'll see. This particular on advance hook method terminates when all the iterations have completed or when all the parties have, have gone away. So we'll see how that gets used with the is terminated method on the phaser in just a bit. The next thing we do just, just to do something a little different is we use the bulk register method on a phaser. And what we're doing here is we're taking into account, we have the calling thread, so that's the one, and all the tasks, each of which is going to run in its own thread. So we have one plus the number of tasks, and we're gonna register all of those parties 
with the phaser in one fell swoop. If you recall the previous example, we created just a phaser with an initial party count of one, and then we registered each time we iterated in the loop when we were going ahead and spawning the thread. Uh, in this particular case, just for fun, we're, we're registering everything ahead of time. So in some sense, this is a little bit more like a cyclic barrier use case where we know all the number of parties in advance. We then, once again, will iterate through the tasks using the for each method instead of a for each loop. We could use for each loop too, of course, but we're sticking with modern Java features. Then we go ahead for each task and we make a new thread, which will be a worker thread and start it. And then what we do here is we run inside a do while loop. And the very first thing we do is we call task run. So we're not awaiting anything. We don't have an entry barrier here. We're just gonna run the task. What we're gonna do here is really not important. Again, you can go look at the code to see what the tasks do and you'll see what they do when I run the program example here in a minute, but it's not really all that interesting. The next thing we do after the task finishes running is we use the arrive and await advance method. And this will block until all the other tasks and threads have completed their processing, have finished their run hook method. So in a sense, this particular example is using the phaser as a cyclic exit barrier. So we're essentially doing something and then we're waiting for everybody to finish what they're doing. And then we're gonna go ahead and see if we should continue or whether we're finished. The last thread to arrive, in other words, the last thread to call arrive and await advance at the end of a phase will trigger a call to the on advance hook method. And remember that gets run with all the, all the threads, all the parties in a dormant state. So we don't have to worry about race conditions. And in this particular case, you can see that it's going to terminate when the phase number plus one equals the number of iterations. So we're going to iterate basically iterations number of times in this little loop we've got. And that number of times is controlled by the do while loop you see here. And we're going to keep looping until the phaser is terminated. So as long as the phaser is not terminated, we keep looping around again. And once again, we'll call run. So things will keep looping until on advance decides that we've reached the end of the processing. There's one more interesting piece of the puzzle here, just for kicks. I don't have an, an exit barrier in the classic sense. Instead, what I do is I have the calling thread also invoking the phaser is terminated method. So it's gonna basically sit there and keep checking to see whether or not the, the phaser has been terminated. And when it's not terminated, it goes ahead and calls the phaser arrive and await advance method which will block until all the other methods reach that point as well, because it's being used as a cyclic exit barrier. So what's important here is that this, this loop that's calling is terminated, or phaser is terminated, is not a busy wait. It's basically blocking uh, on arrive and await advance, just like the threads are inside the worker threads that we allocated. So that's why we had to add one extra uh, value to our bulk register that occurred a little bit above where the for each method took place. So that's the end of our example application, demonstrating a whole bunch of different use cases for Java phaser, showing off both one shot and cyclic phasers. And it also showed the use of entry and exit barriers. So feel free to take a look at the code. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go ahead and run the code so you can see what it does when it executes. We're now inside the project for my EX26 folder in my live lessons GitHub repository. And again, just this is all the code here. You can see that we iterate for 10 times. We have 10 tasks. Everything here is just the, the code we looked at a second ago um, with a bit more comments. So all I'm going to do is just go ahead and run this and then we'll take a look and see what the output looks like. So it's building away and then it goes ahead and runs. And you can see here that when we run the one shot tasks, which go from here to here, all that did is it basically printed out the task number and the phase number, and it printed out a timestamp to say when these things ran. And pretty straightforward, you can see how we used the uh, exit phaser as a barrier, as an exit barrier, so that we wouldn't continue until all the other iterations were done. The run cyclic tasks is a bit more interesting, and you can see what it does here is it runs through all these phases from zero, which is the first phase, up until nine, which is the last phase. And every time through, you can see that the different tasks, one through 10, go ahead and, and do their simple computation. Their run hook method basically just prints out this diagnostic with a timestamp. And so you can kind of see what it's doing. And you can see as these things run, 
due to the non-determinism of concurrency, the tasks are running at different times and printing things out at different times, demonstrating again what happens when you spawn a whole bunch of threads. They don't run in any particular lockstep order. This particular computer I'm running on has eight hyper-threaded cores. So it's got basically 16 cores that the Java virtual machine is aware of. And therefore, you'll get a lot of parallelism here. You can see that most of the phases run pretty much at the same time. I mean, maybe a few milliseconds apart or something like that, but it's, it's basically running everything in parallel. And as you can see, all the phases take place in whatever order the tasks run, and each phase takes place before the next phase gets to run. So the phases are all ordered. And you can see here that after we finally reach the final phase, when we get to the place where the phase number plus one equals the iteration count, then it goes ahead and, and the on advance method will return true, which causes the is terminated method to return true, which means that the loops will break out and the method will return. So that's the end of the example. Please feel free to take a look at it. I think it's kind of fun and it demonstrates a lot of the power of using phasers for a bunch of different use cases.